after this started. We had been thinking along the lines of how we wanted to start doing really a women's messaging on policy issues. And interestingly enough, about the time that we were having the discussion towards the end of the year last year, I got a phone call and it was from Mo Anderson who said, I want to, we want to bring some, some great speakers, Star Parker and Kate Obenshane into Oklahoma and would you all partner with us? And I said, well, yeah, obviously. So, so we were um, thrilled at Mo and Richard that are sponsoring our guests today. And I'll tell you an even better story. When Mo came to our first meeting with our wonderful leadership committee, and by the way, would all of our leadership committee raise their hands today and let's say a big thank you. Thank you to all of them. But Mo came in, sat down beside me, and she said, I have something I have to tell you. And I said, what? I said, we just so appreciate you getting involved with us on, on this program. And she said, well, I hate to admit it, but it was really Richard's idea. <laughs> so, Richard, will you stand up? And all of us ladies, let's give him a round of applause and say thank you. Now I tell them great minds think alike, So, because uh, we were le leaning towards what we were going to do. So we hope today's uh, event it will be a catalyst for many more programs that we're going to be doing out the year. So we really appreciate all of you all here today. And be sure to take something away from today that you can share with your mothers, your sisters, your friends, share it in the checkout line, share it with me. Most of the time it's at sporting events while I'm sitting on the sidelines, things like that. So uh, there's a lot of important information because a lot of the women in this room do great work, either with supporting organizations that support women that need help desperately, and also their, their family members. And so while we are great supporters we also need to be terrific leaders and that's what Kate and Star are going to be talking about a lot today so um, with that said thank you again for being here thank you to our sponsors and I'm going to introduce one of my favorite people and one of my mentors who also ha happens to be one of our OCPA longest trustees I believe is uh, Ms. Ann Felton who is many of you all know in the room is the executive director and president of the Oakland County um, Habitat for Humanity so, thank you, Anne, for being here. Thank you. Well, I feel some woman power in this room. <laughs> this is great. It is an honor to be here today and a privilege to introduce a woman who has made an indelible impact on social policy, political, political activism, and the furtherance of conservative ideas. In my role as an OCPA trustee, I have followed Star Parker over the years and have been continuously impressed with her many accomplishments. Star is truly an extraordinary person. Rising up from the depths of poverty and welfare dependency, she is taking a leading role in reforming welfare, health care, and other dependency programs in the U.S. from besting Michael Moore and Jesse Jackson in the U.S. from best in debates into advising various political leaders. Starr has become a nationally recognized and respected speaker and advocate. She is also a past speaker at OCPA citizenship dinner and an OCPA legislative breakfast. I know that Starr will inspire and motivate you, and I urge you to remember what is learned and discussed, not only in this session, but throughout the day. Take it home with you, share it with your family, share it with your friends, pass it on to anyone you know. Let's do all we can to ensure we have properly and accurately well-informed public so that without further ado, I'd like to introduce Star. Thank you, thank you. You know, I'm going to go up here because I wrote my notes. I don't normally write my notes, but um, I'm learning in um, Washington, you use a teleprompter, so I'm practicing. <laughs> Often I'm reminded of the one time I had opportunity to ask Michael Moore a question, but one of the biggest challenges with that opportunity was I had to sit 45 minutes between J Joy Behart and Barbara Walters uh, as a co-host. They were, uh, you know, the show The View is very politically correct, and so they have to have a black, and they were desperate for a black because Star Jones had left the show, and they didn't find Whoopi Goldberg yet, so they were going through any and every black they could, and Michael, um, 
Michael Moore was going to be the guest that day. So John Stossel, who was still at ABC, thought, you know, he brought out this movie Sicko and he will not debate anyone. He will not answer any questions on this. Perhaps we could do something to get him to answer a question, like have Star Parker come and do this one episode of The View and get to the point where the, we're interviewing Michael Moore. So I did it. I had to um, hold my tongue quite often during that exchange. But I just wanted to ask him why he went to Cuba and Canada to see socialized medicine when he could have gone to Compton or Camden or any inner city in this country to see what happens when government takes over the lives of, of others. So um, I think that I'm going to get a special crown when I get into heaven because of sitting between Barbara Walton and Joy Behar for 45 minutes. <laughs> The reason I wrote my comments is because I have some things I want to specifically talk about and the way that they have outlined this morning, there'll be plenty of time for us to go back and forth with Q&A and I can uh, speak my mind. Uh, one of my new friends here in Oklahoma City, as we were, Mo and uh, Richard took us out to dinner last night, kept saying, keep drinking the wine so that tomorrow morning you'll be really honest with us. Since you work in Washington, D.C., we want to hear all of this stuff. I thought, now I'm going to go in and really write my notes. But anyway, for those of you that don't know me, I have been engaged in public life for about 25 years. People that know my story know that I lived on welfare, as was said in my introduction. I often say it's because I believe the lie of the left. And in fact, uh, this Sunday, uh, you'll see an airing of a show called Flashpoint. That's one of your local talk shows. And I was able to share my story on that particular talk show and tell them that I just believe the lies of the left. I believe that the poor were poor because the wealthy were wealthy. I believe that my problems were somebody else's fault. And I believe that America was so inherently racist that I didn't have to mainstream. These were the messages that they've been sending out to minority communities for a long time, in fact, since their existence. Uh, and what I did was get into a lot of just reckless living and a lot of the type of living that we're seeing right now in many of our hard hit communities that is now spilling out into our general population. Uh, sexual promiscuity, drugs, crime. I mean, I already know firsthand about their so-called leaf uh, uh, safe, legal, and rare abortion clinics because it wasn't until after the fourth time that I went into one of them that I had a gut instinct way down deep inside that there must be something wrong with killing your offspring. I and mean, we continue to send this message out in our society and with 55 million dead later, we should take great pause. I paused and yet I didn't stop the activities in my life and within a very short period of time I was pregnant again and in that pregnancy I decided to keep that child and that's how I ended up on welfare. I've been in and out for for about four years at that point and then I watched my life go into a little dark hole over the next three and a half years. So seven years in and out of the system before finally someone looked me in my eye and pointed their finger in my face and told me my lifestyle was unacceptable to God. And when they use that word God I can't say that I knew what they were talking about but I got out of that particular structure because because I knew that there must be something in God with a capital G. And I um, you know, hadn't thought much about some of the activities I'd done, the criminal activities, the breaking and entering, the armed robbery. In fact, I don't have time this morning to go into the details. I did detail some of my life in my autobiography years ago. It's called Pimps, Whores, and Welfare Brats, just to give you a little bit of glimpse into it. And actually, I left a lot of details out because of statutes of limitations that I'm not sure of, and I didn't want to end up in jail. So, but at that Christian conversion, I just changed my life. I went back to school, I got a degree in marketing and business, and I started one. And after the 92 Los Angeles riots destroyed my business, that's when I began to focus on social reform and social policy. One of the main reasons is because my congresswoman at that time, who's making a lot of news over the last couple of days, uh, Maxine Waters, uh, uh, ran these gangsters out to Washington saying that here again, their problems were somebody else's fault. The reason they burned down someone else's property was because of what America had done to them. And I just had had enough and I started speaking out and my speaking out made national news and the next thing I know I was consulted on federal welfare reform. And consulted on federal welfare reform, I knew firsthand about the damage that had been done uh, to our inner cities, to individual lives and so I was able to share that and be able to, um, to, to work with the GOP Congress at that time to get that legislation passed. People are crediting Bill Clinton uh, for signing welfare reform into law, but keep in mind that it took a couple of times 
that he vetoed it before we forced him to actually uh, sign into law because it was he who said that he was going to end welfare as we know it. You know, a lot of the discussions we're hearing over the last couple of days on sequester remind me of that time because they were using the same scare tactics. We were going to have women dying, we were going to have children starving, and then when we saw 50% of roles drop in half, after welfare reform, and the same women that used to send me death-threatening letters were coming up to me thanking me for helping them change their lives. Uh, I think that after sequester is over, we're going to see them try to take credit for, you know, trimming back a little bit of government the same way we saw them take credit for welfare reform after they started seeing the success. We didn't have women dying in the street and children starving. But one thing that I did do after that time, especially after um, debating on Oprah Winfrey's show about welfare reform and what we were going to do, this was between the time that Bill Clinton had uh, vetoed the bill once and we really needed to get that bill passed. I went on Oprah Winfrey's show and she repeated the line of the left that we were going to really hurt these women's lives. And I knew that they were dependent on her because she became their goddess and they're, therefore they're hearing this message and they would be very, very afraid. And in their fear, I thought that perhaps we should inform the churches in their community for what was really going on in welfare reform since we could not depend on the major media uh, to help them understand that they had a cancer in their society and they needed major surgery and that that's what we were doing to help them. So that's when I began my current work. Cure. Uh, this organization that I'm running today, it's the Center for Urban Renewal and Education, and we're a market-based think tank in Washington that looks at ideas to re remove ourselves from the heavy hand of government and fight poverty with market-based solutions. I understand that the pathologies that we've seen in our inner cities over the last 40 years of allowing for this cancer to grow out the way that it has is now spilling over into the majority of society and we've got to get more aggressive uh, with our ideas and pushing them into the public which is why I'm so honored to be here with you to get again today. Last time I was here with this group I was talking about specifically school choice but this morning I want to talk to you about something else because we are looking at women and how we can be engaged in this debate and in turning our country around, turn our country to the founding principles. And one, um, one area that we keep dismissing and we, or overlooking is the natural alliances that we have in our hardest hit communities with the people that have been hit hardest by government intervention in their lives. I moved to Washington, D.C. about six years ago full time. I think I'm there full time. We were talking out. Oh, I still live in California and I work in Washington, D.C. And some people think it's a pretty long commute. But if you've ever been on the 405 freeway in L.A., you know that it's kind of easier to go across the country. But uh, but I, I still try to figure out how that works, especially now that I have grandchildren. It's like they're back in California. My church is there. My library is there. And I moved my business to Washington, not, I guess not really believing it was start to grow and I'd have to be out there full time. But I needed to be there because I concluded, like most Americans, that we need people in Washington, D.C. that understand this country and what, it, what it's about. People that believe and understand traditional values, that choice loses its meaning if it doesn't matter what you choose. We need people in Washington and leaders who understand limited government. The role of government is to protect private property and our personal pursuits, not to plunder us. We need people in Washington that understand free markets. Profit is not only moral, it's good. It gives us the engine for innovations for tomorrow. And in fact, that's how we create the jobs that everyone keeps saying that they want, but yet we keep depending on government to provide these jobs. I am going to need my tissue. I'm sorry, I've been fighting this cold. I went to um, Israel. I snuck away to Israel with Mike Huckabee and, and um, a few weeks ago, and then when I came back, I realized that I didn't, I wasn't going to be going straight home. I came back early because I realized that um, I had to be in South Bend, Indiana, and it was a snowstorm, and I didn't have a coat, I didn't have a gloves, I didn't have anything, and I was just not expecting it. I'm like one of these like totally frequent flyers, and I just mastered the whole experience, so it was very humbling to get there not a coat or gloves or anything, and, um, and then to pick up a little coal, so please excuse me. But one of the other reasons that I went to Washington is because I concluded 
people think most Americans that we need strong national allegiance and defense. We need to understand that America is exceptional. In fact, my life story embodies American exceptionalism, that anyone from any background, any ethnicity, anyone that just even needs a second chance to be born again can fulfill that dream in our, in our country and succeed. This is something that makes us unique to the world, that the station that you're born in is not the station you have to die in. I talk to women all over this country that are in our hardest hit communities, and I was sharing last night with some that were at a reception. But just recently, I was in one of the hardest hit communities of Indiana, in Indianapolis, and talked to these young women about how their fate is not their destiny. And I make them repeat that after me, that their fate is not their destiny. The set of circumstances that you were born into are not the set of circumstances that you have to die in. And that is what's unique about this great country of ours, and we need to be able to proclaim it loud and clear, and so that we can send that message out internationally, so that others that are trapped in dictatorships and other types of, of structures, communism and socialism, will understand that they don't have to live that way if they will fight for the type of society we have here. It's worth preserving our society and our country, and it's one of the reasons that we, I want to encourage you to join our fight. You know, unfortunately, it took an economic collapse to get Main Street to focus on the state of affairs in this country. And I was very glad when the Tea Party showed up because I had talked about socialism in my second book, Uncle Sam's Plantation, more than 10 years ago. I pointed to the vast amounts of programs that we have in our society. I actually said before John Edwards said that we had two Americas. Now, I was not looking at the two Americas in the same way that he was. I was looking at the fact that we had socialism in our inner cities and for the poor, and we had uh, uh, capitalism for the rest of society. I talked in that book about how my transition out and I talked about ideas on how we were going to get others to come out of that state of affairs. What we had is a vast sea of government programs that were set in motion in the 30s and those programs were supposed to lift our poor out of poverty. But by the 60s, a benevolent Uncle Sam was welcoming mostly poor blacks onto this government plantation by expanding these entitlement programs and building welfare policies. So instead of helping people solve the economic problems in particular in black communities that were created from a legacy of slavery and Jim Crow, we made matters worse. We developed out for them major moral problems, the kind of problems that happen to someone when they turn their lives over to others. The means test of welfare alone, don't work, don't save, don't get married, and we'll kind of keep you enslaved to this poverty plantation. We should be ashamed of ourselves as a country that we would allow it to go on so long that we just send them into these housing projects to become just these cesspools of crime and drugs and where, 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 where unproductive men can prey on the most vulnerable in our society, these women trying to raise children alone, that Uncle Sam is paying them to keep that condition that way. Um, the legacy of American socialism is our blighted inner cities, our dysfunctional government schools, and our broken black families. I found my way out, and after welfare reform passed, I thought that we were on, as a country, the road to moving socialism out of our poor communities and replacing it with the wealth-producing American capitalism that had built this great country. So I began to work on other ideas, ideas of school choice vouchers, because once you, uh, you know, we can go out and put out all these little fires, or we can finally take away the matches. And one way that you take away the matches is you start to put a, a worldview and a moral framework into our youth. And once you get them out of these government schools and into schools where men wear collars, we start seeing a big difference in in the lives of those that perhaps are in broken homes and broken families. So I began to work there. I began to work in, in personal retirement accounts and trying to get ourselves weaned from the government controlling all of retirement. And these are areas that people don't think deeply about. We just keep the status quo going, knowing that current workers paying for current retirees is illegal in the private sector. You just can't build out these Ponzi pyramid schemes. But when you think about the, the poor, it's cruelty. The scripture says a good man leaves an inheritance for his grandchildren. Well, how do you, if the only little bit you have that you might be able to save, the government forces it into a little dark hole. It forces you to put in there 6.2%, forces your employer to put in there 6.2% that you don't own. You get a horrible rate of return. And you, I mean, my goodness, now they're talking about just increasing the retirement age. Well, that's really going to help poor people. You know, when you think about the engineering of this whole Social Security system, when um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, well, I think we should have this type of retirement system. He went in some of the socialist countries and said, what, what is the death age? And they said, oh, it's about 63. Well, then we're going to set our retirement age at about 65. That in itself, we should know there's a problem. 
So I began to work on these ideas because the scripture that follows that one that there's a, 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 a that a good man should leave an inheritance for his grandchildren says is there's a lot of food in the fallow ground of the poor, but for an injustice in the land it comes to nothing. And that injustice is that social security system that we have today. But tr the but the challenge for me and for others in Washington D.C. that are hardcore right wing conservative radical. Well, did I leave out any of the terms that they try to call us? <laughs> is that by 2001 we began going in the opposite direction as a country. Power changed political parties, but control stayed in Washington. And then by 2008, power changed political parties again. And incredibly, by 2009, instead of poor America on socialism, becoming more like rich America on capitalism, rich America on capitalism very rapidly became like poor America on socialism. You know, I've always been for the underdog, but I did not think that the underdog would include Wall Street bankers and, and executives and doctors and all of the other people that were under attack once these socialists took up power in Washington, D.C. At root of America's economic problems today is government dependency. And this is what conservative women should be talking about to our youth. Government dependency gripped America's poor and minority community some 50 years ago. And today, government dependency is choking our entire society. 70% of non-defense tax intake is a transfer payment to individuals, 70%. Now, when we had an election last year and, and the candidate on the right began to approach some of these issues, perhaps even in private, every time in public he was asked about them, we saw ourselves backing up. There's nothing wrong with putting the facts on the table so that people can get their house in order. My life was out of control. There was nothing wrong with those people looking at me and pointing their finger at me and telling me that my life was unacceptable to God. In fact, I tell people sometimes that, um, you know, that telling somebody it's unacceptable, that's certainly politically incorrect. In fact, it could be deemed a hate crime. I should be able to sue them uh, for religious harassment. Go get a lawyer from the ACLU and I probably would have won. Uh, I, I didn't know any lawyers then. <laughs> I, I know a lot of lawyers now in Washington, D.C., and they actually remind me of the people I used to hang out on the street corner with. <laughs> this is one amazing place, I tell you. <laughs> but today, 47% of Americans are government dependent. Now, the minute we said that, or, or Mitt Romney said that, everyone wanted to go after him and attack him and say, well, yeah, but those government dependent are people like our seniors and, and people like our, our vets and people like our children. It doesn't matter who they are, they're government dependent. So we as a free people should ask ourselves, is this a good idea? Do we really want our seniors dependent on government after they've worked their entire life? Now they have a bureaucrat sitting in Washington needing to, see, to decide how they die? This is not something that we should be proud of. Here's someone puts on a uniform, and especially now as a volunteer in our services to go in, and then they come out and the government controls even where they get to live because you need to be near a base because the government controls all the education for them and all of the hospital in for them. Why don't we just voucher the whole VA? Let them go live anywhere they want to go at any time they want to do it. You know, it's just in um, Israel, as I mentioned, and it was really an eye opener to see where they have forced military service and they had 17 year olds, 18 and 19 year olds fully dressed all of the time with major rifles on their back. Just unbelievable uh, to see what they're willing to do to protect the interests of freedom. And yet when we get confronted with an opportunity to explain to the American people that we should not be government dependent, that we do need to start weaning ourselves from these scenarios that we, these dinosaurs from the last century that we're trying to drag into this new century of technology, um, we get all scared and scrimmage. We don't want to talk talk about it uh, here in our country. Today, 40% of all births are paid for by Medicaid. 40% of all births are paid for by Medicaid. People are asking me, well, why are you going after Chris Christie for accepting that money in Medicaid and getting into partnership with the government? Because Medicaid is already a disaster. Medicaid pays the bills for 60% of all long-term nursing home care. Our means-tested welfare programs alone, $600 billion. Our entitlements, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, $1.4 trillion annually and counting. $80 trillion just in estimated unfunded liabilities. There are 10,000 folks turning 65 years old every day. Do you really believe that we are going to be able to sustain these entitlements with 65 people turning, uh, with, with uh, 10,000 people turning 65 years old every day? 
while at the same time we had this very unique discussion in the in the 60s the feminist movement that convinced women that children are environmental hazards so don't have too many so when my grandma had nine my mama had five i had two and lost one of those and this happened all over this country so we have a program now that the pyramid has turned absolutely upside down and the opposition party is afraid to talk honestly to the American people about what time it is in our country and what situation our youth will be dealing with as they grow up, our children and our grandchildren. Our current national debt is $16 trillion with a deficit of more than a trillion dollars a year. And we're backing up on saying $85 billion is too much. I was asked the other day on a national TV show, well, where are they going to cut? I said, well, they can cut paper clips since we have computers now. I bet you they spend $85 billion just in paper clips in Washington. <laughs> I would not be surprised. <laughs> Nothing changes there. Nothing ever shuts down. And so when you have just building after building of goods that you used to use 20 years ago, yeah, they should have a garage sale, which is what a lot of Americans had to do when they started downsizing because of the economic collapse. Washington, D.C. is boomtown. It's one of the most prosperous areas in our country right now, and it's um, something really wrong with that. The biggest problem facing our country today is that liberalism doesn't work. Uncle Sam's plantation didn't work for blacks, and it's not going to work for the middle class. So we better start weaning ourselves. The problem for Republicans is that our leaders want to ignore that what's underlying government dependency is moral chaos. We're a culture that's locked in moral freefall, and far too many Republicans want to ignore our nation's social problems. That we're, that we're an aggressive war, a very aggressive war for the very heart and soul of our country. The reality is that we're a split nation again. We're at the same critical cross point that we were in the 1850s when Abraham Lincoln had to look into the scripture and say a house divided against itself can't stand. We can't go on like this anymore. They couldn't go on like that then where we were half free and half slave and we can't go on like that now where we're half free and half slave. We should have been alarmed at the numbers looking at how close we are as a community of people to where 47% are on this side and 47% are on this side. And the ones in the middle, uh, they'll go whichever way that they're asked to go depending on how big the goodie package is. We are not going to be able to sustain ourselves like this. Liberals always want to pretend that they are against war, but they started three wars against our culture that have been raging since the 60s, and our nation is suffering deeply today because of it. And yet, we as an opposition party, or those of you that are part of the opposition party, don't even want to talk about it. Number one, the secular left declared war on religion, and it weakened our public institutions and opened a door for a culture of corruption. When lawmakers, are at 13 percent approval there's something wrong with our lawmakers you know so what garfield said when he was the president he said if you have corruption in government it's because you tolerate it and i think what we've tolerated for too long is this removal of the 